Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week, my Les Paul. What on earth has it be? If you're a frequent viewer of Friday Fretworks, you may well have noticed that the last few weeks and months have been particularly burst heavy. Only last week, taking a look at the mystique and the enigma of vintage guitars, I think it was a fortnight or so before that, taking a look at that incredible recently surfaced 109 1959 Les Paul Standard, currently for sale here in the UK at Vintage and Ray Guitars. And I think it was just a month or two before that, I was taking a look at two 1960 Les Paul Standards, again here for sale in the UK, this time at ATB Guitars. I'll leave all the relevant links down in the description box should you be feeling flush. I think it's about a million dollars worth of guitars between those three there. So you'll need fairly deep pockets. But one guitar that's been fairly conspicuous in its absence throughout this entire period has been, of course, my own burst. A 1980 Greco Super Real. Those of you who've been here a little while may remember the first video I did on that guitar, having recently bought it, way back in March of 2021. It was a guitar I saw and kind of lusted after quite a while, having seen it on Instagram in 2019 initially, and then early in 2021, there it was again, this time for sale. So I snagged it. And as much as that guitar always ticked a hell of a lot of boxes for me, aesthetically as much as anything, there's no point in denying that wasn't a massive factor in me having purchased it, it wasn't without its issues, which is why for the last few months it's been with a man whose name you may recognise from the incredible restoration of my 1962 Stratocaster, Mr Hugh Price. And as much as I guess visually not much has changed about this guitar, I'm sure Hugh would attest to the fact that it has been quite the job. So what has changed? First and foremost, something I didn't really go out of my way to highlight in the original video that I made on this guitar, primarily for the fact that I knew my comment section would be ablaze with those fear-mongering, telling my headstock was about to imminently fall off, was the fact that this guitar at some point in its clearly checkered history has had at least one neck break. Maybe more, it's hard to say at this point. And as much as the repair job itself clearly was a little bit of a dog's dinner, I knew this when I bought the guitar, it never overly concerned me. Structurally, it seemed relatively sound. The guitar played well and crucially held tune perfectly which of course isn't to be sniffed at with a Les Paul but it was a little bit of a niggling doubt in the back of my mind primarily for the fact that I wasn't a massive fan of the stinger that black kind of covering that had been applied to the back of the headstock principally to hide the extent of the break and then of course once that had been removed the extent of the repair was fully visible but needless to say after a few weeks with Hugh it is now virtually seamless the first step in the process after assessing the strength of that initial repair was to sand and strip the back and sides of the headstock and apply a mahogany veneer using a vacuum press after then removing the remnants of some kind of seemingly soft filler from the previous repair job then filled the open cracks using mahogany dust mixed with West Systems epoxy before then recarving the volute with a volute losing the veneer edges by which point not only was the repair infinitely more kind of tidy, I guess, for want of a better phrase, very Welsh phrase, but no doubt structurally stronger. Or something else that had long bugged me about this guitar was the neck profile. And I'm not going to go too heavy on the history of Greco, or the history of the Super Real or Lawsuit Era guitars in this video, as I did cover that fairly extensively in that original video that I made, which I shall link to above. But suffice to say, any information you can find out about this era of guitars is invariably a little hazy and invariably secondhand and translated from Japanese. So apologies if this clashes with any of the information that you guys out there know. But it is very much in my understanding that these early Super Reels were crafted using a 58 Les Paul standard as a reference point and thus that kind of goes some way towards explaining the slightly cumbersome neck profile and the smaller frets. Now while the headstock was stripped it made entire sense to go the whole hog and strip the neck and recarve it using a template he would made from arguably my favourite guitar that I've ever played. Maybe some slight degree of hyperbole in that but it is 
a staggeringly good instrument. It's a very early 1960 Les Paul standard known as Granger Burst, so named after its kind of long-time owner, famed session player Gary Granger, who then sold it to a very good friend of mine, Mr. Andrew Raymond, who's been kind enough to give me kind of fairly good access to that guitar over the years, enough to let me fall in love with it anyway. Very much use that guitar as a template in more than one respect, but I'll come back onto that in a minute. Now in regard to recarving the neck profile, once that was done, red grain filler was applied, followed by a cherry lacquer, going suitably heavier on the volute to mask the repair somewhat, and on the heel to help aid that colour blend back into the body, which we'd left untouched. All that was left to do then was to reapply the original Greco serial number, which thanks to their numbering system, much in the same way as Gibson's uses the year as the first digit. So at this point, I'm either in custody of a 1980 Greco Super Reel or a 1960 Les Paul Standard. I'll let you be the judge of that one. The last thing then being to apply some tinted clear top coat before polishing the guitar to a high gloss. As I mentioned before, a defining feature of these Super Reels is invariably this smaller fret, which, if they used a 58 Les Paul as a reference point, does make sense, as Gibson were using a smaller fret wide during this era, but combine that with the larger neck profile, it always left me feeling as though this guitar had something more to offer in regards to just its general playability, and as such, we made the decision to refret it, but not before levelling the board and filling the gaps around the inlays, presumably that had been left when they were replaced. Now, in regard to the refret, it was a decision I didn't take lightly. They were the original frets on the guitar, and I guess it would have been nice to leave those on there, but in regard to its playability, having refretted it has vastly improved it. Again, we used Granger Burst as a reference point, not strictly 59 accurate. I do believe they are bigger frets than you would have got in 59, at least in my experience, but of course, Granger being a working man's guitar, I've no doubt that guitar has been refretted and repaired various points throughout its life, but... As I said, the refret has been a vast improvement in regard to its playability. Last but not least, Hugh made a new nylon nut for the guitar before, lightly relicking a bit of razor check in here and there, the back of the headstock and the neck, just so the guitar looked commensurately aged, I guess, across the board. And voila, as good as new. Or at least as good as you can expect for a 43-year-old guitar. <laughs> Again, those who keep semi regular tabs off Friday Fright Works probably will have seen me using this guitar as a little bit of a guinea pig or kind of testing bench, I guess, switching in and out different sets of PAF style pickups over the last two years. When I got it, it had one of its original Dry Z pickups. That could be a video into itself, honestly, on the Fable Dry Z pickups. It's a very interesting story. They were manufactured by Maxon and are highly revered and very expensive these days as well, as I've just found out having a quick look on a reverb. And one of its original Dry Z's and a replacement Wiz. Since then, I've chopped and changed a couple of different sets. I put a set of throwbacks in there, of course, very well respected. I made a video on that. It's had a set of Monty's in there and currently has a set of Sun Bears, which I do really like. I want to do a little bit more chopping and changing in regards to the pickups. So I'll kind of make an update video on that, no doubt, in the future. But one thing I definitely think is going to be worth a video unto itself is a relatively quick, simple, cheap change that I made entirely at Hughes' behest, which exceeded all my expectations in regard to how much it would actually affect the tonality of the guitar. Not just acoustically, but crucially, electrically. And that is experimenting with different bridges and tailpieces. Honestly blew my mind, so that'll definitely be an upcoming video in the next few weeks. So what are my final thoughts on this guitar? Now I guess it's the nearest to completion as it ever has been. Honestly, I love it. I always have them. I guess they were just one or two niggles in the back of my mind in regard to feeling like this guitar had more to give than I was currently getting out of it. I guess first and foremost is testament to the level of whose craftsmanship that 
all things told, a relatively simple change like a net carve can totally transform a guitar. Couple that with a refret, again, just making it that much easier to play. The difference is night and day. I don't know whether this guitar sounds better or whether that is purely psychosomatic, given that it is that much easier to play now and it's just drawing different stuff out of me, but it, it is about as drastic a change as you could ever do to a guitar. And again, it's testament to craftsmanship that the neck is now virtually indistinguishable from the guitar on which it was based on. It's a very, very impressive job. It's also worth mentioning that the electronics were upgraded, although initially for strange reasons, I guess. The pots in there were absolutely fine. They were the original pots, and I think to the correct spec as well, or vintage correct spec anyway, but they were done to the original Japanese metric system, which made getting aftermarket knobs more accurate to a burst an absolute bloody nightmare. So we stuck in a set of bare knuckle 550k pots, which again, I would say is an upgrade definitely worth doing. Overall, very, very impressed by this guitar, I need to say, in case you hadn't guessed already. Relative to some Gibson Custom Shop, which I guess is the natural comparison, I would say it's easily on par, if not better than, a lot of the Custom Shop stuff that I've played recently. But at the same time, possibly not as good as one or two guitars that I've played that have really stuck out to me. Namely, a collector's choice number 13 that I've played at the Glasgow Guitar Show, and a Les Paul that belongs to a good friend of mine, Ed, a Murphy Lab Age one that um, he was kind enough to loan me for a Cardinal Black gig later last year, that again is an incredibly good guitar. But I guess both of those would probably set you back anywhere in the region of eight, eight and a half, nine thousand pounds. So not really a fair comparison to my humble Greco in that respect. But actually come to think of it, that last Les Paul had a set of PAFs fitted as well. So that's really not a fair comparison. But um, honestly, I'm just excited to, to finally get this Greco out on the road. I've never really used it much in the heat of battle. As I said, there were always one or two niggles in the back of my mind as to feeling like this guitar had slightly more that it could offer and wanting to get it to a point where it was as good as it could be before I really put it to the test. So uh, with so many dates coming up, plug plug, all of our tour dates down in the description box. There's quite a lot coming up, especially throughout April, May and the summer. Just really excited to get it out on the road and see how it fares in the heat of battle. So, uh, yeah, if you want to see me doing that live, then you know what to do. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for probably decidedly less, less Paul burst-orientated episode with any luck. Cheers, guys. I'll see you soon.